Our next speaker is, is uh, Stone Lebrandi, and um, he's an amazing game designer. He's been working in uh, the game industry for, for over a decade. Um, right? How long? Um, Maybe about 15? 2000. Yeah. So um, he was uh, a game designer at Blizzard. Uh, we worked on the Diablo series. Um, he's been working uh, at uh, Maxis, uh, where he, he worked on uh, Spore and, and uh, other games. And um, he's also a, uh, uh, a game design uh, teacher and educator, and someone who has done uh, amazing work, uh, both as a game designer and as someone who uh, thinks about games and game design and how to communicate uh, about it, how to teach it, how to talk about it, and uh, just uh, doing amazing uh, work. So please help me uh, uh, welcome Stone Lebrandi. Based on the last talk, I just want to go on the record and say SimCity is a game. And, uh, if anybody wants to come and challenge me about that, I'll be happy to to uh, grind them down into the dust by the end of this discussion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I've been working on this game now for about three years, and uh, it's a huge, it's an epic undertaking. I'm trying to build or simulate this a giant city. Um, it's got a multiplayer component this time around, so we have to deal with all these issues of cooperation versus competition. Uh, it's got a new, bunch of new systems that have never been in a SimCity game before. Uh, just It just covers so a broad range of almost everything, and, and the more you talk about it, then people say, like, well, my city has this and your city doesn't, so you need more stuff in your game. Um, but for this talk, I'm going to talk very specifically about one thing, which is just the agent system, which is new uh, in this iteration of SimCity. Uh, so it's going to be a very focused talk, not a, a broad talk. That's what Frank asked me to do. So because of that, it might not apply at all to anything you guys will ever do in your life, because there's not a lot of simulation city games out there to work on. Uh, but hopefully in the spirit of this conference, uh, you'll be able to draw some parallels and see how I solve some of these challenges as well. All right, so I'll start out. I want to talk a little uh, briefly about some of the previous SimCity games and how they achieved their magic. Then I'll talk about the agent types and behaviors, what we're doing in our game, that's a little different. Uh, most of the talk, or a big chunk of the talk, will be about the design issues, things, problems that I discovered along the way, the team discovered, and how we tried to solve some of them, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. And then, uh, time <coughs> permitting, uh, we'll, I'll do a little bit of a demo, not a lot, but um, just enough so that you can see some live action. Uh, the game is all about movement, and so showing slides just doesn't do it justice. All right, so uh, first of all, who has not played a SimCity game, one of these four games? Okay, uh, our, our military expert there has not played SimCity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you probably, most of you have probably played at least one of these games um, in your life. And, you know, if you notice the dates of these things, uh, the last one, surprisingly, was about 10 years ago. So we're going to be coming out almost 10 years after uh, SimCity 4 came out, which is this huge amount of time in the video game world. Um, and it's a sequel that a lot of people have been waiting uh, for for quite a while. So all of these, these first four games were all kind of the same in how they approached the idea of a city. Here's a screenshot of the first SimCity game. Uh, I just found out recently that the file size of this game was two megabytes. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation is 10 megabytes. <laughs> put things in perspective, what's changed. Um, you know, so Will Wright, of course, worked on this game. And you can just tell by looking at it, it's a very um, a spreadsheet kind of game. There's a bunch of squares. And you fill in these squares. And depending on what's in a square, it affects adjacent neighboring squares. And so the game is really about where do I put these different things? What squares am I going to put them in? Which one's a road? Which one's a factory? Which one's a house? And so on. So uh, when SimCity 2000 came out, and I, personally, this was the one uh, that really got me into SimCity. And we were running this at my work. We had a, an, an Apple computer just set up just to only run SimCity. We didn't do anything else on it. And we had heard this rumor that if you run the game for a million years, simulated years, there'll be a supernova that will destroy everything. 
Um, and we wanted to see that happen. So no one was allowed to really like ever turn it off because we wanted to generate as many hours as possible. Um, it turned out now that I work at Maxis, they're like, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so don't try this at home. Uh, SimCity 3 was really, uh, 3000 was mostly just a graphical upgrade uh, to it. It's basically the same idea. So we're looking at this isometric thing, but you can still, I don't know if you can see it, but there's still these little like grid lines everywhere. Uh, each one of those is a cell that you're putting some data into that's affecting other parts of the grid. And then SimCity 4, it added this idea of regions, but in some ways it was just more bigger grids that were communicating with other grids. So it's kind of like a meta grid of region. Uh, the region had a bunch of cities, and each city had a bunch of buildings. Uh, so it's just kind of this recursive thing going down, uh, but still all based on this kind of grid cell sheet, um, spreadsheet uh, type structure. So when I talk about the agents in the new SimCity, it's like, this is our new our key point, this is our new selling point. We finally have agents in our game. And a lot of people, executives at EA included, say, but SimCity's always had agents in it. What are you talking about? And you know, your memory of old video games is a lot different than when you go back and look at them for real. Because your memory has this ability to somehow like make it seem glossier and more pixels and more colors. But you know, this is, um, these are cars right here driving up and down the street. So it's like, well, it has agents, it has these cars driving around. And let me zoom up on those so you can see what's going on. Uh, so that's a car back in 1989. Um, the, it's like, what is this? Any guesses? Start of a car? Yeah, it's the, the, that's the front of a car um, coming out of the crosswalk. <laughs> yeah. Because that cell in front of that building had determined that it should have traffic on it. So because of the activity of the buildings, the size, the density of those buildings, the cell that has the street says, I should show some cars. But the cell down here doesn't have buildings next to it. So they're like, oh, I don't need to show cars. So at the crosswalk, they magically appear. They drive off to the other crosswalk, and then they would disappear <laughs> off the other side. So they don't actually exist as anything other than just a, a graphical indication that these buildings next to it are of high density. And this goes all the way up to SimCity 4 where if you build a dead-end street, um, like down here, you still see traffic driving up and down, and the cars <laughs> arguably look a lot better. Um, but when you zoom up on them, they, they don't look that great. But um, they still just disappear when they get to the end of the street, and then they reappear and come back at some other, uh, other point in time. All right, so before I get into really kind of what's going on with the new SimCity, let me talk about what I even mean by um, an agent. You know, what is, what is an agent? In, in, my design sense, what do I have to, um, what's a good way for me to think about it to get my problem solved? So it's very simple. For me, it's just a carrier of information. Its job is to take information from one part of the city and move it <coughs> to some other part of the city, and that's about it. Um, so a very simple example is you have this source, say a house. The house decides that it needs to create a worker and go maybe collect some money. So it creates an agent. That agent travels along some path, some down a street, goes to a place where it can work, gets some money, and then it'll go backwards. Then the store becomes a source. It sends out an agent that looks for a house uh, as it sinks, and then it just returns back again. So that's it. That's pretty much all that's going on, is instead of just looking at a bunch of spreadsheet cells to determine what's going on, you create an agent, you send it into the world, and then you wait and hope that it arrives at a sink sometime in the future and transmits that information around. Um, so kind of starting out when I was first working on the project, um, I wanted to figure out, I mean, this was before we had a lot of the engine built up, and so I was doing a lot of paper prototyping and just trying to like design documentation, just trying to figure out uh, what can we really do with this system. The engineers were actively working on it. We were doing a lot of prototypes and experiments. Uh, but in the beginning, we didn't even have a transport system. So if you wanted to, say, move a truck from one side of the city to the other, you had to click on it and drag it to get the data from the one building to the other because we had no way of animating the vehicles and actually transporting them around. So it kind of felt like a kid, you know, when, you're, when you play with your cars on the floor and you have to like put your hand on them and zoom them around. It was kind of that game where you're clicking and dragging your agents uh, around. Uh, but I started looking at um, what are the different things that these agents are gonna be able to do for us in the game. And this list here, just some of the resources in the game, and there's you know kind of obvious ones of you know money and things like that, you know carrying goods around, but they can carry sickness. And uh, this one here is kind of key. I'll talk about it in a moment. It's like they can carry around the idea of a citizen, uh, which is a little more abstract. But 
when you look at the game and there's a little person walking around, this is a model of a person. That's not actually the agent itself, the, the thing you see on the screen. The agent is this kind of abstract concept, which is a person and some money. And it just happens to be visualized as something that looks like it has two feet and it's walking around the street. Um, I can also bundle that into something that happens to look like a car. And I can say, it's two citizens plus a little bit of happiness plus some sickness. And that's the packet that that car object is taking with it. Um, a bus, for instance, might have several citizens in it and a lot of money and a lot of happiness and a little bit of sickness. And trucks might have a couple people driving them and some crates or some freight that they're shipping around. Um, the paths are really important for us um, because without the paths, the agents would never get anywhere. And you know, we don't want to ship the game where you have to click and drag all your people around one by one. Um, so when you think about paths, the obvious one, of course, is this road. But a power line carrying electricity for us is an agent system that it's, it's an invisible agent, but it's carrying a packet of electricity and it's looking for paths that are electrical lines. Uh, water, again, is another type of agent that's looking for a path called a pipe that it can follow along to get to the houses. So all of these buildings, um, you know, a power plant is generating electricity agents that then get sent out over the electric network to power up all the houses. Um, and then finally, this last chunk, the units here, um, it's kind of a, a broader word in the SimCity sense, you can just think of it as a building, um, although we have all sorts of units and some are invisible, the player never sees them or can place them, they just, we just stick them in the game to solve certain problems. Um, but in the context of this talk, I'll mostly be talking about people, our Sims, and you know, just carrying information back and forth between different um, shops or houses, factories, things like that. Um, but then you'll see each one also is a container. So these aren't agents um, themselves. They're, this is the resource, the, and the agent is like packaging up this resource and then bringing it from one of these things to another one of these things. So these kind of diagrams early on, from a design point of view, are super helpful, um, not just to give talks later, uh, but to, you know, this is an actual design document that, uh, for the team, and it really helps set up our vocabulary where we can say, look, this is when I say the word unit, I want you to think this thing. When you, I say the word agent, I want you to think this thing. I don't want you to think sim, I don't want you to think car, I want you to think of an agent as a higher level concept um, so that we can get our job done more effectively, that when we say certain words, we're all talking about the same thing. Um, here's kind of a, a bigger picture showing the system in motion. And um, you can kind of see, so you know, you're gonna, this house is gonna send out uh, a worker, the worker's gonna go to this factory, the factory grabs some people, but then when it gets two people, it can pack them into a truck with some cargo. Uh, the cargo's leaving this building right here. It's going down the street. It's looking for um, a store. This person's going shopping. It picks up, it, it takes the cargo, and the sim doesn't carry the cargo. It destroys the cargo when it gets here um, and converts it into happiness. And then it takes the happiness back home again, and this person's bringing money. So there's this kind of exchange of money and crates that become happiness. Uh, to keep this building functioning in your city, basically. And just kind of as an aside, I did a video recently where I talked about um, in SimCity there's money and there's happiness, and people take money and they use it to buy happiness. Um, <laughs> and, and money by itself doesn't help you at all. Like a Sim could be have all the money in the world, but if they can't spend it, they, they get unhappy, and then they leave, and they leave the city. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. But one of the forum posts was, it's like, this game is so shallow, I don't believe this. They're, they're uh, saying that money equals happiness. I thought, as I was looking where to pre-order the game. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, some of the agent types that we have, the, um, the standard one I talked about, you know, foot, a vehicle, the common, like, we're just going to move people around the city. Um, power and water, I talked about briefly, another type of agents. But they can also get a lot more abstract than these kind of obvious things that you can visualize. Um, education influence is a type of agent that gets sent out. And we had a big problem with education in our game because the time scale is such that when you think of a real education institution, you know, it takes years and years. But in our game, everything's happening pretty quickly. And we didn't want to wait, have the player wait the equivalent of you know, a sim year, which might be an hour or more um, of game time before they saw the effects of education. So we just treat a school kind of like a power plant, that instead of sending out electricity, it's sending out education influence. And it's kind of this abstract, vague notion 
uh, but it works in our context to power up the city smartness. You put down a bunch of schools, which are power plants, um, essentially for education. Um, it's also used a lot for the alert system. So when a fire happens, uh, we the building that's on fire sends out a I'm on fire agent, and it starts traveling around, and its sink is a fire station. So it travels around the city looking for a fire station, and when it hits the fire station, then the uh, fire truck, or the fire station creates a fire truck agent, which then goes out into the city looking for fires. <laughs> and because of the way the system works, you're not always guaranteed that the fire truck goes to the place that sent the signal. The fire truck just knows there must be a fire out there somewhere, and it might stumble onto another fire. In fact, it probably will, the one closest to it. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so here's a kind of a picture showing how the system works when you start putting all these components together. So we start out and we've got this um, garbage dump with an incinerator in the town. I built this really simple town with some houses and each house holds one sim inside of it, one citizen. And they, as good citizens do every day, create some garbage. So they start creating this garbage uh, in their house, uh, but they also need money. So they all get up in the morning and they start looking for a workplace. So like, oh, this uh, garbage dump, great workplace. I'll go work there. In fact, in this example, it's the only one in town, so they have no choice. <laughs> and they go there. It stores them, puts one in the truck. The truck then, now it can be powered up because it has an agent inside of it. So the agent starts driving around looking for garbage sinks. And as it finds a sink, it stops briefly, picks up the garbage, looks for the next sink, so on. So we can't find any sinks anymore. Then it returns back. Now, the uh, dump itself is a sink for garbage trucks. It's like, oh, I can go here too. And it'll go there, drop them off. The garbage as a resource uh, gets burned and converted into another resource called air pollution, uh, which will start spreading around the city. And uh, the workers now, their, their job all done. They get their money. They head back home, um, presumably to buy more stuff to make more garbage and repeat the cycle. So we have a lot of these snide little remarks about human conditions. <laughs> and it's mostly just for simplification, but it seems to work pretty well. Uh, so one of the key things um, versus other SimCity games is this idea of maps. And you know, like I mentioned, the other SimCity games, they were all this spreadsheet kind of approach. And so when you plop a police station down here, um, it puts a radius of cells that say, I'm protected, I'm protecting you. If you're in this green area, you're not going to get hit by crime. And so this house right here is like, great, I'm in the police zone, no problems, I'll never have a crime because I'm safe. And if you remember playing SimCity, you probably remember the game of trying to tile your police stations and your fire stations in such a way as to maximize coverage while minimizing the, uh, the number of them you have to place because each one costs you some money. Um, and so you can pretty much get your city crime free if you just spend enough on police stations and kind of tile the whole area like that. Uh, with the new agent approach though, things are a little different, uh, actually a lot different. Um, this house that's right behind the police station, it gets a prime alert, it sends out a signal that says, I'm being robbed, and it goes down the street and it stops, and it goes down the other street and it stops, and it's like, okay, signal dies, can't find a sink, and the police station just kind of sits here, and the police car never even alerted, and this guy gets robbed, even though he's in the backyard of the police station. Um, and in some ways, it's a lot more realistic, and you know, just if the police can't get there, then they can't get there, and it's up to the player to make that connection. And so even if they did connect these two roads together, um, by the time the police car finds its path to there, it may already be too late. Um, and so that's just one of the things you have to consider when you're playing this game, is that the location of these things really matter, uh, much more so than in previous versions of SimCity. Um, so well, you know, why even use these agents at all? You know, what's, what's our main benefits? And there's quite a few of these. Um, first of all, it's more realistic. And a lot of people who play SimCity, like I said, they believe that this is already going on anyway. They'll write that fiction into the game experience. They'll, they'll believe they see things that, they don't, that aren't even programmed into the game. And people are just good at kind of filling in these blanks in video games. Um, but we wanted to kind of take a shot and say, well, what if they all were real? You know, how would that work? Well, now they really need money. They, it's not just a, a global number that says number of citizens and another global number that says number of jobs. And you're just trying to balance these two numbers. You actually have to try to figure out how those sims are going to get from their houses to their workplaces. Because if they get locked up in traffic or whatever, they're just not going to get a job. And there's plenty of work to be had, but you've designed your city poorly so they can't get to work. Um, the workers, once they get there, they turn on these factories and shops. 
So the, the advantages of run by themselves, they need these people to come in and work. And so from the same point of view, like if you don't have enough workers, then the businesses will start getting starved out and they'll go abandoned because they can't make any money uh, for themselves. And then traffic jams. So you actually get real traffic and very meaningful traffic in our game. Uh, the road networks that you draw them out, how wide your roads are, how far spaced apart they are, makes a huge difference in the gameplay. Um, dramatically, you can have exactly the same number of buildings and one player might tile them like a checkerboard, uh, work, house, work, house, down the street, and another player might make these two, like here's all my work and here's all my house, and the cities will just appear and, and act very differently, even though numerically, when you look at the data, they both have exactly the same number of workers, the same number of buildings, all of that. Um, you also get a lot deeper gameplay. So, sure, realism, yeah, it's SimCity, we're supposed to be realistic, we're simulating a city after all, um, but if the game sucks because of that, then we're not doing our job right as a game development studio. So we have to make sure that all of these systems really give us some kind of benefit to the player at the end of the day, that it's not just a bunch of busy work that frustrates them. Um, and some of the deeper gameplay, I mentioned this already, but the streets themselves are now just as important as buildings. In fact, you can argue they're more important than buildings in this version of the game, because bad streets kill cities. Um, you know, I'm sure being in New York, a lot of you see this a lot. Or at least my taxi ride from the airport to here proved that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of planning that you have to do at the street level. And at first we're like, well, is this fun though? Is this interesting for players to, to draw these streets? And it turns out with the right kind of tools and, and uh, we have a free form uh, drawing tool now with curvy roads and all of that. It's uh, people build their road networks now using play tests. They will come up with a road network first and then they'll zone all around it. So a common thing is I'm just gonna spell my name and then I'm going to build a whole city around my name. Um, or other parts of anatomy, or what <laughs> have you. Know, gamers are creative that way. Um, then the other part, this is my favorite part of the, one of the gameplay, is the game's in motion now. It's not a static spreadsheet that you're just filling in these cells with different colors. You really have to turn it on to make it work. You can't pause the game. It's got to be turned on. It's got to be in motion. Things have to be moving. Um, you know, traffic jams cripples a whole section of your town. You have to solve that puzzle. You have to figure that out right away. And that motion, as it starts to move around, if you've ever played, um, most you probably have Pipe Dream, um, where you packed a thing in, uh, in uh, Bioshock with the little flow puzzles, right? Um, it's got that kind of feel to it, where these Sims are flowing out of their houses, they're streaming, they're filling up these streets, and they're looking for places to go, and they're disappearing, and new ones are coming back out. And it's just very alive, very active. I've um, been trying to figure out that, that routing, that flow, <coughs> um, is a big trick, uh, a big part of the gameplay. And uh, you have to think of your Sims now as a resource. In other SimCity games, you don't really think of them too much. They're kind of there. Um, and you, you know you need them, but you don't really care about them. In this game, you have to care about them. You're constantly looking like, do I have enough people? Where are they working? Where are they shopping? Um, do I have enough students? Do I need more students? Um, where am I going to put this new housing development? Is it better to grow this one up and make it really dense and tall, or do I have room to sprawl? Um, all of those things make a big difference when every sim is contributing to your sim society. Uh, the other point is, it just turns out to be a lot more engaging to have sims in your game, or to have agents in your game. Um, you care about them. You'll, we've named them all. Uh, you'll see in the demo that you can click on any sim in the game, it's got a name. Uh, what we did was, uh, went through the census data, the US census data, and we took the top 1,000 male names, the top 1,000 female names, and then the top 1,000 last names, and then we just kind of, we somewhat randomized, randomized them, but different buildings have different seeds, so you see the same names from the same buildings. Um, but you, it was kind of surprising, because you would expect like, oh, you know, we're gonna get tons of Smiths and Jones, and it's like, you know, you get a lot of Rodriguez's, and uh, you know, uh, other names of other cultures now, as there's more minorities in the census, that was reflected in our uh, agents, which was kind of surprised us all. We're like, oh, you know, America, the melting pot, it's coming through in our game now. Um, it's not just a bunch of white citizens anymore. Um, the city, it has this daily rhythm to it, which is, I'd say, hypnotic, mesmerizing almost. You, a lot of us at work just kind of zone out and look at interceptions. <laughs> And uh, you'll see when I run the demo, um, you'll get a little sense of that. There's something about just like watching traffic go through an intersection that you, like you five minutes and you just, I haven't even touched the mouse and I'm just watching cars move around the city. Um, I don't really know why that is, but it's just, it's just 
entertaining to watch. It's, I think it's kind of like watching Trail of Ants, or if you ever have an ant invasion in your house, and, and you, before you kill them, you, you, know, you look down at them, and you just kind of watch their patterns and their paths, and it can be kind of hypnotic in that same way. Um, and then this idea of going with the flow. So as game designers, we talk a lot about these flow experiences and things like that, but uh, for me, this flow is more like a liquid experience, the, this movement, this fluidness of the whole thing, and it has this all kind of swirling around. Uh, oh, the other thing about the, the daily rhythms, too, is the, um, the night and day cycle that we have. So there's, you'll see a shift change. Like when the sun comes up and everybody goes to work, you get flooded with traffic. And then it kind of calms down. There's a bunch of shoppers in midday. And then when the sun goes down, you see this other flood of everybody going the opposite way that they came to work in the morning. And so you kind of get these rush hour um, mute traffic jams. And then you have to decide, like, well, is it worth it to fix that problem? Because the rest of the day, it's okay. It's only these two time periods that I really have this problem. Oh, I'll let them suffer through it. It's not worth the money. It solve the problem for two hours a day. Um, and you see, you get to make uh, choices like that. You wouldn't get in the previous in cities. There's no way to have that experience. All right, so if everything was good, I should just talk, stop my talk right there. Um, and, you know, agents are wonderful, and aren't you all glad that we put them in the game? Uh, but then, during testing and debugging, we get things like this, where the whole city's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's upset that he can't find his work. Um, so, <laughs> you may just laugh too, and then cry a lot. Uh, because this is, this is not a unique case. We, we see this all the time. So, you know, what are some of these problems with the agents? Um, they're slow. You can't get your answers immediately. Unlike a cell, um, like sales in a spreadsheet, I can't just poke at a cell and say, tell me what you know right now. Instead, I have to say, I'm going to send out a bunch of agents, and then sometime in the future, tell me what you know, maybe, because I don't know if they ever arrived or not. Um, so they might not get there. Just because I send something doesn't guarantee it'll arrive. It could time out. Uh, malicious players, which probably will be 90% of our player base, will <laughs> cut off the road when they get sent. So, hey, let's go to work, guys. And as soon as they clear a certain thing, they clip the road at both ends, and then they make a loop. And uh, then the thing just, ah, oh, look, they'll never get to work. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, speaking of loops, the economy itself is this gigantic loop, the loop I talked about with, you got to wake up, you've got to find a job, you've got to get your money, take your money back, then take your money to the store the next day, then change it to happiness, and then wait till you get enough happiness, and then your building starts to level up. Um, that doesn't happen quickly. In fact, it may take a couple sim days before the whole system is kind of energized enough to actually start giving you some kind of data that, um, that advances the game forward even. Uh, they're dumb. Oh, I should mention the fast part. We can make them faster um, if we wanted to, if that was an answer, but it, it's not. It's okay for electricity and some of these other invisible ones. We can send those really fast. Um, it's the guys in cars. We can only make them go so fast before your suspension of disbelief is like, that's not a guy in a car. You know, it's just a blur on the road. Cars don't drive that fast. And so it, it kind of breaks the fiction if you make them go too fast. Um, they're also dumb, um, in addition to being slow. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why, again, we can make them faster, or we can make them smarter, but we always have optimizer programmer types who ruin our design <laughs> fun <laughs> by telling us we have to cut rules and make our agents uh, be more efficient and, and have less, less uh, have fewer choices to make, things like that. Um, like I mentioned, they get absorbed by the first sink, which causes a lot of problems. So we have some logic in the code where when they hit an intersection, they know if there's more jobs to the, to the right or to the left, and so they'll know which way to turn. But as soon as they make that turn, they'll still go to the very first building that needs jobs, which could be a little like 7-Eleven or something on the corner. They'll still stop there, even though there's a gigantic power plant that's key to running your entire system a little bit further down the street. They'll like, I'll go work at a 7-Eleven, and then they'll complain there's no power in the city. So I'm gonna leave if you don't turn on the power. It's like, just go and just like walk down the street. Um, but we made a design decision really early, and, and I'll stand by the decision, which is that we didn't want the player to tell the Sims what to do. Um, you can encourage the Sims, but you can't just pick them up. If you played Roller Coaster Tycoon, you can actually like tweezer guys up and move them around the set you ride this ride right now. And we talked about doing that in this game, but we really just felt like I'm not a mayor. Like part of the, the fantasy of this game is that I'm a mayor, and mayors can't just point at somebody and say, you need to work here right now, because then it's like a dictator sim. It's not really a, a mayor sim. Um, so we, we have to have this indirect control in the game, but at the same time, uh, players frequently say like, 
can't I just make them go to the power plant? Why are they going to 7-Eleven? And then the answer has to be, well, bulldoze the 7-Eleven, or change your road around some way to get them to there. And it's a bit of a pop out, but it's almost like there's a puzzle for you to solve. So solve the puzzle, and maybe don't get too hung up on the fact that you can't just pick guys up and tell them where to go, because that would kind of invalidate a lot of the work and systems that we've built up. Um, the other problem is there, we can make them really smart, and it turns out some of our smarter agents, nobody knows, the players can't tell what they're doing because they're making all of these decisions and choices, but they're not projecting their thought process up onto the screen. There's thousands of these things, so the spam would just be overwhelming if you wanted to see it. Um, but it turns out the end effect is like, I don't know why they did that thing. And it's like, well, because they made all these choices and decisions, and they evaluated all these trees, and they eventually figured out that they should be at this place, and the player can't see it, so they, all that work is just wasted. And then at the same time, you have programmers telling you to watch your performance, and so the two kind of start to meld at that point. All right, um, creates design issues, um, a lot of those in this game. So as a designer, I kind of wish I could just tell the guys what to do. Um, so sure, the player can't do it, but I should be able to, because I'm the designer after all. I can't tell those guys what to do, um, and things are really problematic, and it turns out I can't either, and they are problematic. So I can't easily do statistical analysis on the game. In previous versions of SimCity, I could just pop up a spreadsheet, and I could just tell you, I could take a snapshot of your city, a static snapshot, and I could tell you what should be going on in your city right now. But since this game has to be in motion, I can't look at a picture of your game and tell you anything. Uh, because it will appear to me as if all your traffic was stopped, and I don't know where anybody's going, and I don't know what their intention is or whether they'll make it there or not. So it makes kind of answering really big issues very tricky. Uh, we have some techniques. We get telemetry. We try to get as many people playing, and we just try to do that kind of statistical analysis. Um, but it's always prone to, you know, like I said, the guy with the checkerboard city versus the guy with the work in the house on the opposite sides. Their numbers are exactly the same, but their cities are completely different. It's hard for me to predict what will happen. Well, you know, it's hard for the player, but it's hard for me, and that's really bad as a designer. Not, you know, when an executive comes and plays the game, and they say, that sucked, why did that happen? And I'm like, I don't know. It's like, but you're the designer, you should know. It's like, yeah, I wish I could tell you, but I can't. Um, so, big, big problem. And once you have the problem, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, it's the logic of the agents that's the problem. It could be our transport system, which is handled by a couple other programmers. Uh, could be a scripting problem. So there's so many different bugs. You know, Early, we're still uh, in alpha phases of this project right now. So there's a lot of bugs. And sometimes, with so many systems going on, you don't even realize it's there until somebody does a very explicit test and just tries to like eliminate as many variables as possible and then just look at one very specific, one house, one building, let's see what happens. Um, and then we can spot, like, oh, wait, he should have like dropped off money, but he didn't. Where's the bug? Where's that bug coming from? Um, sometimes with our transport system, uh, intersections will get jammed up and people get lost in intersections, so they can't ever get through an intersection. And then that's not even a design problem, that's a more of a cap finding kind of logic problem. And it kind of boils down ultimately is can I even trust these agents as a designer? Um, and I, in the beginning when I started working on this project, I was like, I'm gonna make a talk about how I learned to trust the agents. And it's like, I still can't give that talk. Uh, because I still can't trust them, trust them to do what I want them to do. Um, where you'll see as I start to go through some of the design, my attempts at making, you know, solving some of these problems. All right. um, this is my whiteboard three years ago. Um, I started just scribbling what I thought SimCity would be like, and just basically. At that time, we weren't thinking too much about the Sims. We were just thinking about the vehicles, the trucks, and driving around resources. So this is going to be one of the new thing, one of the new things for the game. Was it has a resource model, so you need you know you can sell steel or make crates and ship them and, and dig ore and things like that in the game to make these chains. So at this point, this is the at the point where we can kind of drive trucks around by hand. I figured I could just draw this drawing out and I'll figure out all these different interactions. Um, here is kind of my first attempts at just saying, how, how complex is this system even going to be? Um, I think it's probably okay to turn on the lights for some of this other one. How many, oh, okay, yeah. I guess, is that okay? Um, actually, I can do um, yeah, demo right here. Okay, all right. Um, 
So here it was just me just drawing these cities and saying, let me do on paper, before we have the engine and we can really build these gigantic cities, let me tell you in advance, engineers, what we're going to, what numbers we're going to be asking from the system. And so I started drawing these big city maps out and measuring street sizes. And these were all, these had to be accurate, as accurate as I could make them, um, you know, to scale, so I could get some meaningful numbers. And I started playing with kind of like 1,000 meter by 1,000 meter square areas and drawing these little cities and counting up the buildings and figuring out how many people would live in each building uh, to try to get some estimates and numbers to give out to um, our engineers. And kind of came up on it's like, you know, some deviant player like makes these really dense cities with like low density and tries to sprawl and burst if somebody makes a whole bunch of tall buildings. And so there's a whole bunch of these little charts of different types of metrics that uh, prototype or archetype cities that people might make and how many cars that would hold. <coughs> See it too well, but that's like the scale of one car. And then I would just make these like, well, that's 100 cars, this is 1,000 cars. Um, 10,000 cars, and how many cars can actually fit along a street, and what are we really talking about in the worst traffic jam cases, how many cars will be on the road at once, things like that. Um, eventually, I, I started doing some Excel, and at Frank's request, I'm going to show you some Excel. Um, normally, normally, during a, a talk, I would never alt tab over to Excel, so thank you for being the audience that lets me do it. Um, yeah. It's, I, yeah, so I spend a lot of time in Excel, probably like a lot of you guys do also. And um, I'm actually pretty happy with this spreadsheet. Uh, let's see. So this is um, a lot of, hang on, I've got to turn this thing off. All right, um, so there's different ones for residential, commercial, industry. I'm not going to go through these. This is just kind of the raw data about how much power, water, how many people would live there, uh, divided into different kind of classes. The, the little bit that I did want to show off was my, um, this is a city grid, so this is about, um, represents blocks of a city and what you could fit into a different block. And so there's kind of these codes that you can type into each block to build fake cities in Excel. And then it would tell you all of this data down here, all of these numbers. Um, I know you can't see these, but. Um, so this is like um, commercial, industrial, residential, and what density it is. And then the fun part was you could just go in and say like, at the starting city, and then I can go down and I can get all the numbers uh, generated down here for me. And then, because I didn't want to keep typing this data in, of course, so you know, mid-game cities and late-game cities. And we can start to see these numbers change uh, as we work our way through the data. And we can evaluate electricity usage, uh, water usage, uh, how much money people will make, how many jobs are in the city, things like that. Um, so it's kind of nice, just an interactive approach to early on to trying to help me understand, you know, crazy max population cities, max density cities, and, and so on. Um, so that was kind of fun. So I just wanted to show that off. So those only got me so far because of all the problems I've been talking about where I needed to see this thing in motion. So um, at that point in the development, I'm like, I've taken these spreadsheets about as far as I can take them. The engine's starting to get built up. We really have to start doing this for real in software now. The numbers and paper and stuff is we're kind of getting to the end of that. And, but I still didn't really have a good feeling for what was going to be happening with the simulation part of the agent part. So I drew these diagrams, and don't worry at all that you can't understand them, because in five minutes from now, you will. Uh, so I'm going to kind of look into them. So this, uh, this is a one-page diagram that happens to be almost as big as that screen when you print it out and hang it on the wall, a little bit smaller. Uh, this said, like, this is our simulation. This is what we want to achieve. And it kind of talks about the whole scope of SimCity on one piece of paper. I'm going to, of course, be in PowerPoint. It's a terrible way to look at it. I did bring some documents in. I'll put them out at the table at the end if you want to walk around and look at them after the talk so you can actually see these things a little better. The idea, though, is I thought of these as kind of pachinko machines. Originally, I'm like, oh, it's like a pinball machine. You launch a sim into the city, and it bounces around, and then you see where it falls. Right, but we have 10,000 of these things, so it's a pachinko machine, not a pinball machine. You're just dumping huge floods of these marbles in, in this case, to the top of the city. And each one of these wealth classes, they're in their separate channels. So the low wealth people are looking for low wealth places to stay. Uh, mid wealth, mid wealth, and high wealth are, uh, people are looking for high wealth buildings. 
And you can kind of, if you think of that as like a faucet that you can turn off and on uh, different taps and say, if I put a lot more airports, then I'm gonna get a lot more rich people. If I put a lot more bus stops, I'm gonna get a lot more poor people. And we generalize like that because rich people never drive buses or ride buses. So. Um, each track um, has two main components to it. And you may recognize these if you've played previous versions of SimCity. It has a wealth dimension to it and it has a density dimension to it. So when a player starts to play, and they start zoning residential, the first thing they typically get is some low density, low wealth uh, buildings will move in. And these guys don't care too much. There could be pollution on the ground. Uh, the power doesn't even need to be turned on. Uh, these low wealth guys will live anywhere. They take tons of abuse um, and they'll stick around. Like uh, we, we call it a gardening game and these guys are like baby weeds. Um, so they, they grow and they might look kind of ugly, but they're still living things that you still have to care for. Um, if they get happy and the road system supports them, they start to grow in density and they start to grow up and eventually will become these high density uh, kind of slum towers. And if you, opposite, if you decide to clean everything up, put a lot of fire school, uh, protection, police protection, schools, uh, parks, things like that, you can push the wealth level up and they'll go this way. So if this is a small weed, you might think of this as like a, a little rose or something, a, a beautiful rose in the, in the corner here. Um, of course, there's kind of this implied goal for the player is you want to get up to here. Like, I can grow re weeds, really hardy weeds in my garden, or I can grow these beautiful roses, but I really want hardy roses. And there's a bit of a, a trick that I'm doing, it's kind of mean, but um, these guys kind of suck. They, um, they, as wealthy people, they, the town doesn't need a lot of wealthy workers, but it needs a lot of lower class workers to survive. Um, and they use up a lot of space in proportion to the numbers that are in that building, and they use more than their fair share of resources. So they're using way too much electricity, way too much water, and they're producing way more garbage than the poor do uh, for the amount of land that they're taking up. Uh, the main thing we wanted, uh, that I wanted to do was to make sure that there was kind of this, there was no right answer. Because if there was a right answer in SimCity, then everybody does this and they get to here and they say, I just won SimCity because I got this high wealth, high density building. Uh, the reality is, is that you need all of this stuff in different combinations to make a city work. And that was one of my kind of subversive statements that I wanted to make in this game. It's like you can't just kill all the low wealth people and the world would be a happy place. Um, because rich people would be happy they'd have to put up with this riffraff in their city. Um, because no one can clean their cars anymore. Um, so, these, you know, again, part of my political statements that I'm throwing in here. But they are kind of fun to stick in. Um, the, uh, at the bottom here, uh, let me back up real quick. The um, system of happiness is really key to everything. So these guys need to get happy, and they get happy by shopping, as I mentioned. They get happy by going to parks, and pretty much everything else can make them sad. So if, they, if they're involved in a crime, they get sad. If there's pollution, they get sad. If they get sick and die, they get sad. So all sorts of things can cause them to be sad. And they, it's kind of a battle between happiness and sadness. And when they get too Basically, when they run out of happiness, they say, I don't like the city anymore, I'm gonna leave. And your goal is to try to keep them at least one unit of happiness inside each sim, and everything's gonna be good. Um, but if they get sad, if they're low wealth, there's a potential, the guy won't leave your city, but he'll become what we call wealth zero, which is homeless, and they just wander around your streets, and there's um, this little, I don't know, mini game, but, uh, if you clean up your garbage, they'll leave faster, but if you leave your garbage out, then they'll hang around more. <coughs> so my wife in particular, I was telling her about this, and I'm kind of laughing about how clever I was, and she just was appalled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you have homeless shelters in your city? Like, why is it not a building you can put down? And I'm like, well, that just make more homeless. Like, why do you want those? If you're trying to solve the homeless problem, that made her more angry. <laughs> But that worked a lot, actually, uh, it comes up, it's like, how do I solve the homeless problem? And I'm like, well, how do they solve it in real life? And I'll put that in the game. Anyway, then when they leave their house, it goes abandoned. Abandoned houses become criminal hideouts and burn down really fast, and they're, they count as garbage, and the citizen people living next door to them don't like them. Um, so those systems kind of start kicking in, and then you get this kind of decay, this urban sprawl, or not sprawl, just like urban decay, basically, uh, starts to spread out over the town. Um, I won't go through the commercial and industry too much. Uh, they're 
once you understand that residential kind of flow from the top coming in, bouncing around, finding a place to, to live, trying to keep your happiness, can't find it if you drain out the bottom, um, they all behave the same way. Their happiness definitions are just slightly different. So for the Sims, the residential, they get happy by shopping or hanging out at parks. For commercial, they get happy every time somebody walks through the door and buys something, gives them a little more happiness. And if they don't have enough sales, they'll start to, um, their happiness will lower, their profit will lower, and then they'll go abandoned as well. Um, there's another you know, little kind of thing going on in the game, which I like a lot, which is that when you look at any track, so the four people can only, um, I shouldn't call them four people, but the correct word I should be using according to EA is the low wealth people. Um, <laughs> and so the low wealth, mid wealth, and high wealth is um, they only shop in shops that cater to them. And so the low wealth people will only look for low wealth shops and, and mid wealth and high wealth and so on. And so if you don't have enough high wealth people to support high wealth shops, they'll go abandoned, but the poor will never shop in those high wealth shops. But it turns out the way the money system works is that everybody just has one money token. They can only spend it in the type of store that matches the type of money token they have. So when you look at it across the whole board, you have these low wealth people who go to work every morning, they get a low wealth token, they spend it in a low wealth shop to get one unit of happiness and then they go back home and repeat it. And the high wealth people are doing exactly the same thing. They get up in the morning, they get one token, they spend it to get one happiness, and then they go back to work. So both channels, or all three channels, are doing exactly the same thing. Um, they're just doing it at different scales. But they all have to get up in the morning, work, and spend their one token on one unit of happiness. So a lesson there for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Tracy was still here because her the, uh, the row talk basically. So this is already. I should just actually give this to her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they all jump right out. Uh, they're not happy. They'll go abandoned as well. Uh, there's also another channel of tourists that can come in that don't live there, and you can try to attract tourists. And so it's possible to make a uh, enough residential just to power up the workers, and then the shoppers can all come from uh, tourists out in the bottom. And then the last one, the industry, it's basically the same. They have a slightly different thing about instead of wealth, they tech up instead of wealth up. And so you use education to kind of power the, uh, the level as well. And we get a lot of interesting stories from the game with this too, where again, the players kind of believes that this is the pinnacle and they should be reaching for this. But if you have this and you work really hard to push to this, you end up, uh, a lot of people go out of work because these <coughs> hold huge amounts of low wealth people and these don't hold as much. And so if you have a big community of like a big area of, of low wealth people and you transition over to this high tech industry, you actually put a lot of people out of work in your city and then you have to deal with the consequences of a lot of homeless in your city and which will then cause a lot of uh, urban decay and so on. So there's a lot of really nice systems because of the agents moving all around that we get this kind of like natural flows that kind of mimic um, at least superficially uh, things that are happening in the real world. Um, and that would follow me out as well. Here, so thing, okay. This will be a quick demo, but um, I'll probably do a little after five. The, this was one of the another one of the one-page designs that I did to talk about an individual agent. So those previous diagrams that I just showed you were what happens on the scale of ten thousand agents. How do I understand these gigantic streams and flows of these people moving through the city? And then I still had to answer the question of well, how do I understand the flow of one guy? What is his what's his brains, his smarts? How does he move around the city and decide what to do? And this chart, after a lot, a lot of iterations, um, was kind of like, this is, to me, this was pretty clear and obvious. Let me walk you through it real quick so you can see what's going on. Um, in a house, um, they store happiness and money. Every day they get up and they lose money for rent. So the money is just going to drain out slowly. They, you know, they need to spend it to get happiness, but if they don't spend it, it drains away anyway. There's a chance they can get sick. And if they're sick, they're pulled out of the workforce, so they're not gonna be contributing to the rest of the health of your city. Um, and then they're gonna start queuing up for hospitals. And if you have hospitals, no problem. They'll go to the hospital, they'll hang out there for a while, and then they'll come back home healthy. If you don't have a hospital, they roll the dice every day, and there's a small chance they'll get healthy on their own. There's a small chance, or uh, medium, most of the chances that they'll just stay sick and unproductive. And then the biggest, and then a very small chance they just die. Um, if you don't, you know, they have some incurable disease and a hospital and so they their house. Um, the, there's another group, we added this later, of kids 
that were a special type of agent that just looks for schools and parks. And if you don't have schools or parks, they tend to become criminals. <laughs> and that was actually my wife liked that one. So, um, they, if they're healthy, then they get up in the morning, they look at their bank account, and if they have money, they're like, I'm going shopping. Like, right away, they don't bother. I don't need a job. I already have money, so I'm going to go shopping. <laughs> if I shop, I'll get happiness and take it back home. Um, there's actually some branching stuff going on here where they don't always go back home. They could kind of bounce around for a bit in the system before they made their way back home again. Um, if they can't find a place to shop, then they hang out in a park, which still gives them happiness, but it doesn't cost them any money. The trade-off is it costs you as the mayor money to run that park where the stores give you money as the mayor. So it's a kind of player decision. It's like, I can make the most beautiful city, make everybody happy by just putting parks everywhere, um, but I'll never make any money to fund those parks in the first place. Um, so you can try experiments like that to figure out um, you know, what's a good balance in your own city between things. The, um, eventually, you just cave in, I might as well work, there's nothing else to do, there's no place to spend my money or get happiness, I'll just go collect some more money, and hopefully that'll come in handy later. Um, if you don't have any money, the first thing you do is you try to work, get some money, then you hang out at a park and put these guys slackers. And um, then if you can't find that, you just hang out at home and watch television or whatever all day um, and sit you there. So this, in my mind, at least at the time that I drew this diagram, was pretty clear, especially compared to if you could see some of the other diagrams that I did first. Um, this kind of, like, okay, now we know, now we have this algorithm, this flow chart that we can run these through. So at least they're pretty predictable. I kind of get a good sense, and it turned out that it was still too complicated when we really got to testing it. So um, I kind of looked at the diagram. This is one of the great things about drawing diagrams like this. It makes it really easy to solve problems because you just look at where you have a lot of noise on the chart, which is over here, and it's like, I just need to put that uh, heavily. Um, so I just kind of knocked off a huge chunk of work that we had to do. And in the process, though, instead of having this kind of all-in-one sim that could just get up in the morning and make decisions based on their bank accounts, um, instead, we had to make two very specific classes of sims. So in the new model, there's a shopper sim, and their job is only just to spend money. And they have a one-track mind. They just get up and they look if there's money in the bank, and, if, and then they go, and if there is no money, um, then parks, and they stay at home. And then there's a worker class now who never shops, and their job is just to bring money back to the shopper who can then go do the shopping. Um, this solved a couple problems. Um, you know, it is a simplification the system, but I think a really good one. I was really happy with it. At first, I resisted it. It's like, oh, you're making them too dumb. You know, it's, it's too one-dimensional now. But it turns out the systems are, turns out the city as a whole functions much better now. Because in the, in the degenerate case in the first system, everybody on the first day goes to work because nobody has money. And then they all have money, and so on the second day, nobody has money. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, normally, everything's kind of phased, so you never would see that happen, but you would tend to get these kind of clumpy behaviors. Um, and this is like everybody's shopping and working every day in a proportion that I can now control as a designer by just going to a spreadsheet and saying, okay, make more workers proportionally to shoppers. And I can tune that really easily now to get the right rate of um, flow through the city that we want. Um, there's a chart like that for a lot of different systems. I'm just talking about that one. I don't have time to really kind of dig in that one, but just briefly, um, I'll show you a couple other ones. There's this one here for tourism, and the tourists come from outside the city. Uh, rich, like I said, they'll come in on, um, or high wealth will come in on ships and planes. Uh, the low wealth will come in on just buses and train tracks. And the mid wealth, they can do anything. So mid wealth we made is like they're, they're jack of all trades. They can go anywhere, they can transport they want. Um, but it lets the player kind of tune their city structure, whether you want to attract high-end tourists or low-end tourists. And it's really easy to bring in the low-end tourists and then try to make it up in volume. Um, and we're, we're interested to see with beta testing which kind of cities are going to be more effective, like a few rich people or a lot of poor people, which ones will give you better city structures and, and what are the consequences of doing that. Um, their, their little thing, their loop that they go is pretty simple. They look for a place to shop. Uh, they have a kind of a wallet. They have so much money and they look for a place to shop, then they look for a hotel, and then they just keep looping around, and as long as they can find shops and hotels, they stay until their wallet's drained, and then you don't want to be in your city anyway, so <laughs> you, you are glad to see them leave. Uh, but the gameplay there is to try to keep them in this loop, so if you don't have enough hotels, then they'll leave early, or if you don't have enough shops, then they'll leave early because they can't find a way to spend their money, and then you as the mayor are like, oh, they have money, but I, I didn't take it from them on the way. It works really good in the casino system, where there's a special building you can build, 
um, a hotel that's attached directly to the casino, mm -hmm. so they can't actually escape. <laughs> <laughs> the loop is closed and, um, and guaranteed until you drain them and then, goodbye. <laughs> this is um, kind of a broad view. I'm not going to get too much into the details, but this talks more about that trade system that I mentioned, the trucks, and how you're moving goods back and forth um, across what we call the global market. And so you can buy different kinds of things, ship it in, bring it in by train, um, the global market will um, kind of, doesn't really exist in your city, the, it's a kind of abstract concept, but everybody who's playing SimCity, because it's multiplayer, is all part and contributing to the global market. So if everybody decides to sell oil, then the price will plummet. And if everybody buys oil, then the price will skyrocket. And it's not an auction system, it's not like World of Warcraft or anything like that. We actually define the highs and lows, so you know, we, Maxis has control, you know, we're price fixing in some ways, the bounds. Uh, but it's up to the players uh, within that system that the prices will dynamically be set. Uh, but this describes how the trucks come into the city, what they're looking for, and this is kind of my first drawings that I usually do, and then for the team, I decorate them, and they look something like this. They're basically the same drawing um, as far as information content go, uh, but this one just, people will look at this one where they don't like to look at the first one. Um, so these are a lot more compelling. But this is showing the flow of of goods uh, from the global market in powering up power plants, selling it, drilling it, or uh, digging it out, and so on. Um, and then just to kind of jump to the high level, everything I've been talking about, multiply that by about 25, because uh, that's how many high-end systems that we have in our game. So this is my spreadsheet showing uh, all the high-level systems. So you know, within the garbage system, for instance, um, there's also recycling and different kinds of garbage plants and things like that. So they start to break down into subcategories and we have to figure out the agent system, the rules of all those, how those interact, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and eventually you end up with thousands of these agents and things in motion, all with different agendas, moving all around, crossing back and forth. And then you hope because you did the work on each line on this chart, that when you put all the lines together, it just works. And it almost does, like it's amazing. Uh, so I'm gonna kick over to the demo, even though I'm out of time. Okay. Okay. Um, and let's see. So it's. Um, this idea of entertainment versus simulation comes up all the time. It's like our goal is to entertain players and. Uh, Mike Perry, who worked on a couple of the previous SimCity games, on when he left EA and he came to me, he's like, okay, you're gonna be lead designer on SimCity? There's only one thing you need to know. SimCity is not a simulation of a city. It's a puzzle game. Don't ever forget that. And that was kind of his party words to me. Um, and I've really taken that to heart. It's like, we try to convince the player that they're a mayor and they're simulating the city, but if, you know, if they were really simulating the city, they would be a terribly boring game. Um, catering to player expectations, a lot of this comes from people who played previous SimCity games, and we're finding this is a bit of a problem for us right now, that some of the hardcore players come in and they're like, where's my grids, where's my data, where's my this, where's my that, and it's not there anymore, and it really frustrates hardcore players who, who love it. I love SimCity 4, there's, there's still people playing SimCity 4 10 years after it's released, passionate about it, they still play it to this day, and we come out with this new game, and so of course, with all sequels, uh, you risk offending those people because their X that they loved is not in there anymore. Uh, but when we bring in new players that have never played before, we tend to get a very positive response. So we're still trying to juggle uh, with a lot of that. And uh, the beta feedback will be coming soon. We hope to go beta sometime early next year. Uh, when we do, all, everything I said could be invalidated. Um, when we get this big flood of feedback all at once, it may be oh, great, I need to go back to these lines and, and redraw them. Um, the final little bit, uh, just a thank you to Maxis. Um, I'm standing up here representing the company, but I don't want you to get the sense that like, oh, this is, I've made this game. Like, I did not make this game. I designed parts of this game. Um, as a designer, I'm actually happy. I could have shipped the game in this form. <laughs> it would have followed my plans and it would have worked just nicely. Um, and you can't see it, but this is a beautiful nighttime scene with the moon coming up over, over top. And all of this work, hundreds of artists, animators, graphics programmers, a dedicated terrain guy, dedicated road guys, helicopters, trains, all of that stuff, the hard work of, of the whole team. And I want to make sure that uh, you guys don't leave here thinking that I did SimCity because I didn't. Um, it's a, a team effort. Um, and that, thank you again.
just a little bit later and, and join to the next session. But uh, yeah. Do all people earn happiness uh, in the same way, or does it vary between each agent? Um, different, like I mentioned, the, the people all get happiness in the same way by shopping, by converting money into happiness, or by hanging out of parks. Sorry, what I mean is, do they quantitative, quantitatively earn the same amount for the same activity, or does yeah. that vary? Yeah, and we have the ability to change it if we wanted to, um, but for tuning reasons and simplicity reasons, we keep it flat until way late in the process, and then we'll do fine tuning like that. Because at this point, all the tuning is as flat as I can possibly make it um, across as many systems as I can make it, so I can understand it in my head. When we finally get a nice baseline, then we'll go in and we'll say, oh, you know, donut shops give two, but this other thing only gives one, and then we can start tweaking it. But I, I always wait for the last possible moment to make changes like that, because keeping track of it is really difficult. Yes? So is, is your city to your old Sim 4 version, or is it tuned looking at real Sim and how they actually um, It's tuned for this game to make this game as enjoyable as possible. And we're still trying to figure out you know, what that means, because like I said, some people run at fast speed, and they get upset if you turn down the speed, and some people want to run at slow speed, and um, the amount of time, I have other charts, in fact, I may have some up here, um, that I can show you later, but they kind of spread out the whole arc of play over four hours and what I would expect to happen in the first four hours of gameplay. And so I try to tune to that. And then we do the beta test, which validates or invalidates my assumptions. And then I'll retune the game and retune the game and retune the game. And that's just a never ending process. And even after it goes live, we'll patch it and tune it. You know, So it's something we leave open as much as possible. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you presented uh, the, the pros and cons of agents uh, from after the fact, but when you sat down to say, okay, the next SimCity, um, how did you arrive at, agent, at agents and what was the process for thinking about what was going to be new? Um, so a lot of it was done by uh, our um, art director, Ocean Quigley, and the lead designer, Andrew Wilmot. So after Spore shipped, they had both worked on SimCity games in the past, and they wanted to make an agent, they always wanted to make it agent based. Even when they were working on SimCity 4, they were like, this would be so much better if it was agent based. But the computers, you know, back in 2003, just couldn't handle it. They could barely handle SimCity 4 at the time. If you bought it when it came out, you might remember how terrible it was to make a big city that it was just like, would bog even high end machines would get bogged down. Um, so it was more just a pipe dream that they had back then. And then when Spore shipped, everybody started looking at like, well, what do we want to do next? And the two of them just sat in a corner and said, we want to build an agent based system. And that kind of set the whole tone. Um, a lot of us, myself included, were like, you guys are crazy because of all the problems that I mentioned. Um, it doesn't really scale well, and how are we gonna solve these, uh, these hard problems? And they were just like, we, wanted, we wanna try it. We've always wanted to try this. We think it will be cool. Let's just see what happens. And then my job as a designer was to support, uh, to make systems that could make that a reality, not to fight against the grain. Um, and just as my job, duty was like, make agents work. Um, so, yeah, so day one, we were that way. And, uh, yeah, right here. Um, so, in this game, you've introduced the, the sort of like global multiplayer aspect to it. Um, is there like a, 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 a global population where if you build a city that's like uh, high on green technology, it'll appeal to like other people's cities and people will move from them? Like, what's um, the no, so the Sims, there's an infinite number of Sims. They just come from the global Sim pool, which is make as many sims as people need. So they don't actually flow, it's not like a one-to-one -one from city to city. All those moving trucks are coming in from Sim Nation, is what we call it. Um, they don't actually exist until you, we need them. Um, and that just makes things a lot cleaner because we didn't want people like, uh, fighting over citizens. Uh, so there's just an infinite number of them out there. You pull in as many as you can get. Um, yeah. Um, did you find, I mean, you talk a lot about the difficulties in like testing and, and analyzing the new agent system compared to a, a simpler cellular system, but did you find that that made anything in development easier? Were, were you, was it more parameterized than it was before? Or were you a, you know, a uh, Well, I didn't work on the previous versions of SimCity, so as a designer, I didn't have direct experience. All my knowledge comes from just talking to people who worked on it or just reading all the strategy guides um, to try to figure out what they were doing. And um, coming in at fresh, I think was actually a benefit in some ways, that I wasn't carrying all this weight in from the previous games. I, like I said, I wished a lot of times it was cell-based, because it would have made my life a lot easier. 
Um, but um, this is just the way we're, that we had set up. So, in, um, I suppose this is a dangerous way to start, but in the real world, there are some economies that grow simply by virtue of expansion. They create new construction projects, and that's how they should stimulate their own growth, which obviously only works for a short time, but is that something, because it seems like the construction of new buildings seems to capture agents looking for work. Yeah, or creates agents looking for places to move. So we've actually set up the game um, early on in development. We're like, no one will move in until you have power and water. And you have to build this whole infrastructure, and then people will finally move in. And what we found was that the communication with the player was really laggy that way, because you might not know the problem. And it's much more enjoyable to, to build a house, see the people rush into it, get all happy, and then complain. Because when they complain, then they tell you what you need to solve. And if you wait, if they wait to move in until everything's perfect, that means you've already solved the problem. Um, and and you, might, you don't have that feedback that you might have gotten otherwise. Um, so what happens, though, is that you can build really fast. You can actually overbuild really quickly. And then people will move in, and suddenly your population shoots up, and you're really happy. And then you can't support them, so then they all leave. Um, and you have to balance, there's a tendency for a lot of people early on to just like zone like crazy, and you realize after playing a little bit, you, you should take steps and make sure they're supported, and then build more, and then make sure they're supported. Does that answer the question? Yeah, but also just a quick follow up. So the flip side of that is if there's a recession and you run out of jobs, is there, does this support the idea of like creating massive public works to try and rebuild your economy or um, something like that? Actually it does not, I never thought of it in that way that you just phrased it, but we have out in the region, um, which I'm not showing because I was in this isolated box, um, out in the region you can build like airports and these bigger structures that are multiplayer things that you get everybody in the region to all work together to build what we call a great work. And when those things get built, uh, they only function if they have huge numbers of people working there. And so then you have to decide with your region mates, like, well, who's gonna make, who's gonna house all these guys? Because we've spent all this time building this airport and now it's just sitting there idle we need 10,000 workers. So who's gonna build those workers? Who's gonna build those houses to hold those workers? And then there's negotiation with your neighbors, which is one of my favorite parts of this game with multiplayer, is how you have to kind of work city to city to make sure that you have all the needs that the region as a whole can use. Go ahead. Uh, do you think that uh, as technology allows it, that uh, SimCity and The Sims will merge back into one game? I hope not. <laughs> it's it's hard enough to understand this game. I mean, there's so much going on in this game already. And I know that's a common desire for people who play The Sims and SimCity. It's like, this should be one happy universe and everything should just work together. Um, and maybe, yeah, in the future that will be the case. But already just trying to keep track of a city without this uh, another game embedded inside of it is already <laughs> complex. It just would hurt my head. <coughs> So with the, the engine of the glass walk engine that we have to explore this, have you gotten other ideas for games that you would like to make or take care of, you know, I'm going to just take the glass um, Yes, quite a few, actually, which I can't talk about. Um, no. But I will say that all the new scripters that come in, their first job is their the first, well, one of their tests is to actually build something on site on their first interview day is to build something with the glass box engine. And we give them like a three or four hours and say, here's this new engine that we have, this new technology, build something and let's see what you build. And we have some kind of tutorials that they can run through and we can test them. But then once they're hired, if they show that they have the aptitude to read instructions and copy things line by line from a wiki page um, and duplicate it, um, and we hire them, then the first week is to build their own game with the technology. And we've had all sorts of things, like one guy made a, um, a winery yeah. and somebody else made like, uh, was a honey factory where you had the flowers and bees and the bees would move between the flowers and, and then they would get, uh, trucks would come with bottles from a glass factory to package the honey and sell it. Um, somebody made like a, a snowman thing and somebody else did just a bar where there's a bunch of drunks in a bar and they're all like, kind of jostling to get to the front of the bar. <laughs> so yeah, this is, it's pretty wide open what I think could be done with it. And EA, our Maxis in particular, has put a lot of investment into the engine that's powering all this stuff. So you can expect to see the glass box label stamped proudly on several games. Mm -hmm. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, I really like the sort of tilt shift uh, photography effect that you have. Yeah. Do you, maybe this is too big of a question, but do you have any idea why these worlds in miniature are so fascinating? Um, They're so sweet and so interesting. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the work of Ocean Quigley, um, who really pushed on that, um, that look, that aesthetic for our game. And he is really into just 
as toys and model train, model railroading, those kind of things. And you know, you can go online and you see a lot of these tilt shift. Um, the camera I just bought has a button that says tilt shift right on it that you can actually put <laughs> instant with no extra effect. The camera does it now. Um, so it's getting more pervasive. You see it a lot now. And it just felt like it was a great match because it makes things look smaller. And we wanted the player to kind of feel like this is a toy set. This is a uh, Yeah, exactly. And, if, and you know, you can go that path and saying, well, let's make it realistic. And that's a bit of a trap in, an, in some games like this where then the players start to ask for more realism and give a little bit. And if you go down this other path where it's kind of not real, more toy-like, um, you can, yeah, you can get away with more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Yes. So after you make a design decision to not allow direct control over the characters and you have this complex system being going on behind the scenes, how has your playtesting process um, sort of taught you how to, how to teach players to solve their problems indirectly? Um, a lot of tutorial stuff starts to appear. Um, a lot of, um, you didn't really see it, I didn't talk too much about it, but people will pop up balloons and there'll be these little thought balloons all over the city saying, I don't like this or I'm happy with that. And by just kind of scanning the top balloons, you get a sense. And then there's layers and layers of drilling you can do down to like a wall of text if you just want the encyclopedia entry um, to learn how the game works. Uh, but most of it, we just want to be more organic. Like we don't think players will read walls of text. You know, we know they don't. Uh, but it's there as kind of our, our last stop before you have to go buy the strategy guide. Um, but it, that process is a lot of the work going on right now to get ready for beta is just to answer just that question. Like there's huge teams now just trying to make the game approachable. There's actually a good point. Um, there's so many systems going on that there's this kind of tension between what we put in and what we expose to the player. Because on some level we feel like we're so clever we should let the player know everything we do. Um, but then that's just overwhelming. So we say, well, let's hide some. But then the players wish they knew what was going on. And so there's kind of this like en endless loop basically between how much do we show versus how much do we hide. And depending on the person, different people want to see more of us. Um, wait, did you have a question? I was just going to ask about the structure of the design team around this project. OK, so um, me as a lead designer, and then two other designers, um, one who's mostly in charge of the multiplayer components, and one who's in charge of the city simulation components. Um, then underneath both groups, there's scripters. And I think we have maybe about 10 or more scripters, maybe 12. And their job is to take our designs and actually get it in the game. Like, we have the easy job. We just have to write documents. Divided between those two teams. Um, yeah, not equally divided. But yeah, there's some, uh, a few on multiplayer, which doesn't have as heavy a simulation, and a lot more on the city part, which is a lot more in depth. And so for instance, there'll be one scripter whose job is the crime system. And he goes through the, goes, OK, there's an arsonist, there's a mugger, there's an um, embezzler, white collar crime in this game. And he has to make sure that all those systems work according to the spec that we've drawn up in our design. Uh, but at a high level, there's just three designers. Uh, but I consider most of the scripters designers as well, uh, just at a different level. They're really down in the guts of the thing. Uh, but they come up with a lot of great creative stuff as well. Great. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up there and take a 10-minute break. Thank you.